Well, I'd say that first of all, we've just registered our ninth record year in a row. This quarter is the smallest quarter uh, that we have in the year, and it was affected by the later Easter. So it's going to be, you know, less powerful than it was last year. But we feel very good about several of the key measures that came out in the quarter, including our active pass base, which was up 5%. So we're, we're seeing trends that would suggest a very strong year ahead, and I'm, I'm feeling more confident about being able to deliver our 10th record year in a row. What about the 8% decrease in the number of guests? So that's, that? it's very simple, Sarah. Easter shifted, so spring well, breaks timing. didn't happen, um, whereas last year this was all in the first quarter. So basically people who would have come didn't because the parks weren't open. So they are now open, and that shift basically was, was all offset. In, in the first few weeks of uh, Q2. Talk to us about the, the growth in passes. You're, you're trying to shift yes. more of your, your visitors uh, into subscribing to those sorts of uh, models. How does that alter pricing and, and what percentage of total visitors uh, are on those passes? It's a really great question, Wilfred. And basically the, the model is to move to membership to drive recurring revenue. And we've had incredible success there. The growth has been double digit on memberships. And as a result, that's pushing our active pass base up. But even better than that, the price of a membership ranges from about $60 you know, with a season pass to a starting point of $90 with a, with a membership, and the premium memberships are over $200. Mm -hmm. So you can see that indirectly you pick up pricing that way, and that has driven the highest per capita revenue that we've had in the company's history. Literally, the first quarter, which you've just said, our smallest quarter, had the highest per capita in our history, which is, I think, something to be celebrated. I, I mean, you're mostly a domestic business, but you do have we growing do. international exposure. Yes. How's that rollout going? It's something that Wall Street is, is pretty eager to get an update on. Absolutely. I mean, Wall Street is very interested in it, but we have to put it into perspective. Outside of the North American business, our international business represents 3% of our revenue. So it's very small with opportunity to grow, and I'm very excited about that. But our domestic business, including Mexico and Canada is extremely strong and powering ahead. On the international front, if you think out 10 years from now, by 2030, a billion more people will be in the middle classes, primarily in China and India. And we are driving growth there, parks there, to be able to satisfy that long term. And our brand is so strong globally, we can do that. You recently had to defer your $750 million EBITDA yes. target for, for an annual uh, performance back a year to 2021. Is, yes. it, is that still the... The guidance? That is the guidance. It, re that? it requires 8% growth. If you look back over the last nine years, we've uh, grown EBITDA at 12%. To get to that target, we have to grow at 8%. Last year, we grew at 7%. So we would have grown faster except for the macroeconomic hit that came in China towards the end of the year, and that really slowed us down. So we're, we're feeling good about that. It requires hard work. It's never easy, but we're working very hard to try and get to that number. Another